Well, that was exciting. Sorry. <laughs> okay, welcome everyone to the third lecture in our 2024 installment of our Scholars in the Square series. I'd like to greet those of you who are joining us through Zoom. Hello, Zoom people. Those of us, those of you who are joining us in the future through YouTube, and those of you who are here with us this afternoon at UVic. Today, after a 20 minute talk by May Ritchie, Craig Powell, an activist, prison chaplain, and recent minister, will join me for a 20 minute conversation with Meg. And then we'll spend the last 20 minutes in a broader conversation with folks in the room and people on Zoom. Our speaker today is Megan Ritchie, a CSRS graduate student fellow and a PhD student in the Interdisciplinary Studies program. Meg is moored in the education department, but her interests and skills are not confined to a single field or discipline. Before she started her PhD, she completed a BA at UVic in psychology and an MA at the University of Ottawa in counseling, psychotherapy, and spirituality. Since 2019, she has served as a clinical counselor at the South Island Center for Counseling and Training and a teaching assistant in environmental studies. Meg shares with so many people here a deep concern for the ways our environmental crises that we're witnessing are affecting the mental health of so many of the most vulnerable people in our community. Part of her sensitivity to the current predicament in which we find ourselves is her eagerness to learn about the contemporary and historical forces in play. And so with that in mind, as I turn the podium over to her, I want to acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory we stand, and the Songhees and Esquimalt and the Sainish peoples whose historical relationships the land continue to this day. So please join me in welcoming Megan. Great, thank you all for coming. As I was thinking about this lecture and considering the built space that we're meeting in, I was wondering how could we bring more sense of connection with the natural world into a room without windows? <laughs> <laughs> so if you're open to it, I invite you to close your eyes or soften your gaze, place both your feet on the floor and notice the soles of your feet connecting to the ground in the view. You might even imagine roots spreading out from the bottom of your feet into the earth below. Take a deep inhale and a full exhale. And as you continue to take a few more long, deep breaths, consider how trees and plants and phytoplankton sustain your every breath as we breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. Trees breathe it in. Trees breathe out oxygen. We breathe it in. We are constantly, always breathing together. Take one last deep breath in and out. And you can open your eyes when you're ready. I invite you to pay attention to the sensations in your body and your emotions throughout this hour. Yes, this is an academic talk. The topic is really a spirituality of your body, both our own, but also our larger bodies, coextensive with the natural world. Our bodies that do not end at our skin, but are only made possible through a profound level of interdependence with our surrounding ecosystem. I hope we can engage our intellects here, but also our hearts something I think is foundational to effectively address an ecological crisis. So my research is about climate conscious members of Generation Z, their relationships with the natural world and their experiences of ecological breakdown and climate change. We explore their emotions with a focus on processes and changes in their understanding. Consider transformative experiences, people and events they have, that have supported and built their resilience and inspire the past they've chosen. I'm not a member of Generation Z, but as a millennial, I share a lot of the concerns of those I interviewed during my research. So I came to this topic from a place of desperation. I needed better tools, ways to process emotions, and a better framework for understanding the mess we are in. I was working as a counselor, and whenever the climate change topic came up, things like, how can I bring kids into the world? My parents are climate deniers. How can I be hopeful when hope feels impossible? I felt at a loss for how to support others because I was at a loss myself. And so several years later, I'm getting better at talking about it, wrapping my mind around it, 
And I think most importantly, learning to hold multiple emotions in tension. We're in an ecological crisis and no one feels this more deeply than young people. Gen Z, born between approximately 1996 and 2012, have contributed the least amount to the crisis but will bear most of the burden. And they currently have little decision-making power on the global stage. There's been an explosion in research, especially survey-based research in the past five years regarding the mental health impacts of climate change on young people. This is helping us to see how far reaching and prevalent this phenomenon is. As you can see on the slide, most young people are feeling the impacts and for almost half, it's affecting their daily life. This data is from 2021 and 2022. I'd be curious what data from 2024 might say. So what I wanted to contribute to this field and where I saw a gap was in story-based research that would give voice to some of the statistics to add texture and nuance to research that necessarily distills complex climate emotions down to single word categories like, for example, eco-grief. But rather, I wanted to know, how does something like eco-grief show up in the body? What does a person do with it? What else interacts with that grief? How does a person transform it into action or come to under understand it in the context of their life? So the individuals that I interviewed were all residing in DC, that many of them had grown up or spent time in other provinces and other countries. I was working with a small sample size, which means the individual stories and experiences didn't get lost in the data set, but it also means I'm not generalizing my findings to Gen Z as a whole. And this is happening in a North American context, and we can talk more later about what that might mean. Okay. This slide contains a lot of big topics, and it's just meant to situate us. So what you're seeing are themes that arose from the interviews and were present for the majority of the people I talked to. Today, I wanna to focus on one component of my research, eco-spirituality. While all the themes around the circle can contribute to eco-spirituality, I wanted to focus on the two themes that I have circled at the bottom here, embodied spirituality and ecological identity. Which seem to form the core of what I'm calling eco spirituality, and I'll get more to term get more to terminology in a minute. Excuse us, Meg. <laughs> All good, Hillary. Welcome. <laughs> Happy to break the ice here. <laughs> Thanks for bringing greenery with you. Uh -huh. Sorry, y'all. Yeah. Um, yeah. But first, I want to address address why this topic might be important. Spirituality is often left out of mental health conversations and climate activism, even though it can form the backbone of meaning, purpose, and community for many people's lives. And I think absolutely has a place in mental health care and climate conversations. Mm -hmm. This theme arose repeatedly throughout the interviews, and I think it holds a lot of promise for inspiring change, deepening and expanding one's sense of identity, creating a strong foundation from which to act with conviction, and building emotional resilience. Two prominent systems theorists had this to say, ultimately, deep ecological awareness is spiritual awareness. When the concept of the human spirit is understood as the mode of consciousness in which the individual feels a sense of belonging, of connectedness to the cosmos as a whole, it becomes clear that ecological awareness is spiritual in its deepest essence. Mm -hmm. So what is eco-spirituality? If John Nelson could see this slide, he would be horrified <laughs> by how much text is on it. So bear with me. You'll see here a lot of related and overlapping terms. And I just chose definitions that were in the literature that connect to all of these terms, but there's certainly many ways to define all of these things, except maybe reverential naturalism, which let me know about that. Um, so it's really this cluster of concepts that I'm working with and considering around this topic. 
And I think some of what is so powerful in these worldviews, and it surprised me a bit as I was talking with young people, is that firstly, it doesn't require a pre-existing spiritual framework or even a pre-existing orientation towards the spiritual. And secondly, encounters with the natural world that can evoke the sense of connection can happen in so many different contexts. You don't have to go on some remote wilderness adventure. It can happen in your backyard garden. So what does eco-spirituality look like? Drawing on the data from the interviews, it seems to have two main components, embedded components, whoops, embodied spirituality and ecological identity. In other words, one sense of spiritual connection comes from nature experiences themselves, not an existing framework or set of beliefs. It's practice-based, multi-sensory and embodied. There can be intellectual aspects, of course, but it seems that often people live it first and then find the words for it later. Individuals talked about being in constant conversation with the living world, relating to non-human beings as teachers or family or friends. And when it comes to this idea of enchantment, eco-psychologist Sharon Blackie offers a definition that I think aligns well with what some of my interviewees described. She says, to live an enchanted life is to be challenged, to be awakened, to be gripped and shaken to the core by the extraordinary, which lies in the heart of the ordinary. Above all, to live an enchanted life is to fall in love with the world all over again. Some people talked about a deeper identification with other species, feeling empathy and compassion for their suffering, and recognizing that the relationship goes both ways. The people aren't just in nature to take what they need, but also to offer gifts and thanks and protection. One of my participants said, I do come out here when I need things, but I also have my own practices where I'm able to thank the land for what it does for me and for my loved ones and for everybody, you know? So it's kind of like staying in that conversation. So I'm not always just running to something when I need it, but also to be there in gratitude, to be there to say thank you and to listen. In this slide, one of the participants is talking about rituals that connect her with the natural world. She says, when I can't fully dunk my body in the water, I'll just go put my feet in, just go sit under a tree, lay on the beach, any sort of thing where my body is touching the ground or together, like without shoes on, without that barrier. I think as a woman, I feel really connected to water just because the water and the moon and me, we're all very connected. And so I feel very called to the water. I'm very emotional too. I'm always in flux and I find that I can look to the water just as that starting place from where I began in the womb. And it's just always here to carry me through the days. And for this young person, you can see his identification with the beings he's helping to care for. He sees them as objects, not subjects. And I'll just read the second part. I find that spending some time with these animals and with these organisms is also what gives my work passion and purpose because I really care about everybody. And I'm hanging out with these little guys and just seeing them live their life while I'm living my life. We're in the same place, we breathe the same air, we drink the same water. So what's the process for developing the sense of connection? The good news, in my opinion, is that there are so many ways in. While some of the young people I talked to spent a lot of time in, natu in the natural world as a child, others didn't and developed the connection as a young adult. For some, it was attuning to rhythms and seasons in the natural world. For others, it included being invited into rituals and ceremonies and being immersed in old growth forests. For others, it was risk-taking and pushing their physical limits in breathtaking settings through mountain climbing or skiing or hiking. But for others, it was about slowing down, listening deeply and paying attention. One young person from the Malahat Nation said, people move too fast in today's world, but they don't take the time to slow down and listen. And there's only very few who are willing to listen. That's why I love the plants and working with gardening is because you have to be patient. 
You can't just expect the plant to grow in a day. And that says a lot. For some, it was connecting to their family's land-based practices. And for others, it was through more formal education and understanding the issues scientifically that their sense of connection was strengthened. This was the case for Freya, who says, I was a botanist over the summer and there was a lot of names for us to memorize, but categorizing everything, that's some sort of worship in itself. Our need to understand things, our need to connect with things in that way, is something that I think a spirituality could be built on. I'm related to that moss over there, allegedly, like millions of years ago, or like a frog in a stream or a salmon running up the river. I mean, it reaffirms my spirituality in that sense. I think that there's this whole, I think everything in nature is also part of us and everything in us is also part of nature in that way. So what's it like to live with this evil spiritual lens? It can shape how a person experiences themselves in relation to the planet. People talked about it creating this unshakable foundation that inspired their work, to protect a world that they saw as sacred. But not everyone I interviewed saw themselves as spiritual or resonated with that word. And I wanted to be careful not to read spirituality into the data. For some, reverential naturalism, or maybe just deep respect, might land better. Some people describe their experiences in nature with phrases like perfect, innate, just felt right, it's a friendship, but didn't see it as spiritual while others were deeply sure that spirituality was central to their experience. But no matter what words they chose, everyone expressed reverence, awe, and a deep appreciation for the world around them. Cool. It's not all perfect though. There are challenges to this worldview. It seemed to open people up to access more of their grief. Through this deeper sense of connection, there seemed to be more intensity of emotion and it could feel isolating to live in a society where nature is objectified and you don't see it that way. So this young person said, the fact that Fairy Creek made me realize this deeper spiritual connection that I have to nature and all of that, it's also kind of made going through my days a bit harder because I see just how deep all of these institutions go that seem to be against any sort of relationship that isn't extractive. I see over time, my relationship to nature has become more spiritual. And if I spend too long sitting in that feeling, I just, I kind of want to collapse. She does go on to say, I don't understand it. And it's like, I can feel the pain, but it's given me something to fight for. This drive that I found has become my purpose. It makes me feel more alive. It just makes me sad that we're so far away from our connection to nature. I'm still trying to find hope in all of it. It's an active process, but the hope I found is in what I can do. If we decided we are, if we decide we are too far gone, it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy. By trying to find things in everyday life that can make the world a little bit better, that's where I find hope. So how does eco-spirituality potentially build emotional resilience? And of course, more research needs to be done before making any definitive claims, but here's what showed up for the people I talked to. Eco-spirituality can offer a source of identity, lead to greater compassion, purpose, and meaning in life. It fostered a sense of belonging to the living world, that when they were alone in the woods or by the ocean, they were not truly alone. It helped inspire and motivate action. And it offered a form of spirituality that was accessible no matter one's background or interests or location. And it didn't necessarily make things easier, but it seemed to bring people into closer contact with their emotions, a sort of catalyst for increased processing and integration of their experiences. People seemed more in touch with the pain, but also with the joy and the beauty. As one young person said, there's beauty, to, there's beauty to be found in the plants, deep in the earth, in the ocean. There's lots of stuff that's good in the world. So 
So I wanted to end on the slide. We mostly talked about people's words today, but part of my research also included gathering art, photos, poetry, and found objects from the participants to add another dimension to their stories. Especially when talking about something like the spirituality, words aren't always enough. Each of these images has a story attached to it, which we don't have time to talk about today, but certainly added depth to the research. And I'll finish with a quote by Rachel Carson, because how could I not? <laughs> <laughs> Those who dwell among the beauties and mysteries of the earth are never alone or weary of life. Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. The more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe, the less taste we shall have for destruction. Okay, thanks very much, Meg. That was great. So now we're going to uh, pivot a little bit, and um, people who are on who are watching us on Zoom can send in questions, and, and Rachel will represent them for us, and we'll also take questions from folks uh, in the room. All right, so. Who in the room would like to ask a question? No, or, no, or, or a conversation? Oh, pardon me. Just kidding. How are you guys? How are you doing? My name is Paul Mahan. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Me too. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. I'm living in the future. Yeah. 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 I want to start with some of the concerns about the uh, climate crisis, because to me, it feels such a like such a big thing, and I find it so worrisome myself um, in many parts. But I wonder if there's something specific that is like maybe that you've seen Gen Z reacting to, like, are they worried about their own backyards? Are they worried about food security for the planet? Is there anything specific about the climate crisis that this generation is worried about? Hmm, that's a good question. I really feel like it spans the whole range and people are tapping into the things that resonate with them. So some people I talked to, like ecological restoration was their thing. That was their mission. That's what they were up to they're gonna devote their life to that. For other people, it was other things. And so I think, especially with social media, we have access to all the problems. So I think people really are connecting with all of them. That's my sense, but I'd be curious to do more research on that. Right. Well, like you said earlier, you not you can't speak on behalf of the entire generation. So I'm sure it varies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so all, and all the people that you interviewed, were there any that weren't doing any practices? Like, did you select people for interviews based on the practices they're already doing, even though they didn't, they didn't see them as practices per se? I talk louder. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> um, I have to come back to your question. Like everyone you interviewed mm. was doing something eco-spirituality based? Yeah, what's the inclusion criteria? Yes. Yeah. Everyone I interviewed <laughs> felt emotionally impacted by climate change and felt like they had had some sort of experience in nature that had shifted their worldview. So it wouldn't need to be a practice, it could be just being in a, at a particular event. Um, and for some, a lot of the people I talked to, they're students, like, I wish I was more involved. I wish I could engage in more of those practices on a regular basis. And I'm working and I'm in school. Um, and those are kind of in the background, but I know they're there and I know I'll come back to them. <laughs> And you said some of the interviewees found that their eco-spiritual practices were helping their climate anxiety and some were finding the opposite. Did any of them engage the practice as an intervention? Like, well, I'm really feeling overwhelmed here. What can I do about this? I'm gonna go forest bathing or whatever it is. Was anybody mm -hmm. thinking about them as an intervention or just they connected the dots maybe because of you? Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, they were thinking of them as interventions. Not everyone, but um, people would, people who are very aware of their mental health would say, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I know that spending time in nature is gonna make a difference. I know that going to this particular spot by the ocean, I'm gonna find that sense of connection or that, that message that I might need. Um, so yes, guess would be the short answer, absolutely. <laughs> I think there's that awareness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I come from an institutionalized religious tradition so I kind of think in those terms too, but I wonder if any of these, if your interviewees, if any of them had considered, you know, 
inviting others along or kind of semi-organizing it. I know it's not like an organized thing and maybe that's mm -hmm. a virtue, um, but mm -hmm. is anybody doing any organizing on these lines that you know mm -hmm. of? Yeah, I was reflecting on that topic as I was preparing for this thinking, oh, this feels so individual mm -hmm. on one level. And then on another level, it feels very communal in the sense that people feel connected to their ancestors or their tradition or their families through these a lot of these practices, not always. Um, or other people in their activism world who are supporting these spiritual practices. Um, one person talked about bringing her mother into them and sharing some of what she does on the land with her mother. In terms of like structured and organized, I didn't hear so much about that. Um, but I think there's space for that. I hope so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And you touched on this earlier than just now, and I'm curious about the intergenerational aspect. And if I were a member of Gen Z, I might feel a bit of resentment when I think about the climate crisis toward other folks. And I wonder if, if you found that in your interviews and how that might affect the relationship with their elders. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yes, we did talk about that. And it was this interesting mix where people would say, I'm resentful. Like there's so much anger. There's so much, rightly so, so much frustration. And we need the older generation. Like we need their support, we need their wisdom, we need, we need their lived experience. Um, so it was both. It was like this appreciation for this untapped resource, relatively untapped, of course, not in every situation. Um, and at the same time, yes, frustration as well. Yeah. And maybe I'll add to that. It seemed like it really was about going back to the generation where there was some connection to the land. So some people talked about their parents don't really care about climate change or they're not really um, interested in engaging on that topic, but their grandparents who are farmers or fishermen or lived a more rural lifestyle, they really respected yeah. those people's um, perspectives and wanted to learn from them. Mm -hmm. Of course, again, not in every situation, but a couple of people are coming to mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can I imagine my great grandparents' generation where everybody was a farmer at this whole notion of what do you mean connecting to land like i'm on the land all day long every day <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> that's where i connected the city yeah. um and so it might, might feel foreign but um and then yeah but the embodied part is maybe an interesting or or having language maybe for this i mean again my great grandfather you know hands in the soil it's very embodied but um was probably taught by institutions to to remove that connection so um it's, it's nice that, that young folks are being uplifted in that connection, of, but their bodies are honored and seen as sources of valuable connection. Mm -hmm. um, and did you find any, um, feel free to comment on that. I'm kind of rambling maybe. But, no, no, that's great. Keep going. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I'm curious now about gender differences too. Did you find gender differences in how young men and young women or non-binary folks are connecting with their right. social yes. practices? Again, small sample size, so not generalizing, but... Um, and the people that I did talk to and actually Matt or read through some of my transcripts and was really helpful in, in drawing up some of those gender differences and saying like, oh, it's interesting how the men seem to have a much more um, strenuously physical connection to nature, mountain biking, skiing, rock climbing, where there was both this um, appreciation for the place they were in and also there's a deep sense of connection they were building with the people they were with because they were in these intense um, situations. And so I was like, oh yeah, I hadn't really noticed that you're right, it did seem to be more that way. Both were embodied for sure, the women as well, um, but it seemed to be less about pushing their physical limits and more about that sort of mindful attention and communication. So talking about like really being in relationship with whatever non-human beings were in their vicinity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know if this came out in your research, but I'm, I'm intrigued by some of the extremes. So I like the extreme sports or um, one of your interviews spoke about dunking, I presume in the ocean. Yes. That is an extreme sport if you're asking me, <laughs> <laughs> but one that's gaining popularity. Uh -huh. um, did that come out? I mean, almost, because the extremes can almost bring out a transcendental aspect to it too, or demands a flow state. In, mm. in some situations, not all. Mm -hmm. But did that come out, like the, the extreme part? Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone did specifically talk about flow states. 
um, and had like I wish I had them some really beautiful descriptions of what it's like to be at the top of a of a run by yourself and looking around and being like, when am I ever this far from another human being in such a beautiful space? Like this just doesn't happen for many people. Um, so yeah, I think there might be something about the physicality, the focus that's required, and the setting being more than just the setting. Like it's not just a backdrop, it's part of the experience that I can imagine would have contributed to that, that flow state or that transcendental experience. Can I ask a question of, yes. of the two of you? Because I know Greg, you work with uh, folks in this generation too. And I wonder, part of your interest, I think, is to use the insights you get from the study uh, therapeutically, right? So what about people for whom there, there is no, the crisis is so deep, the world is alien to them. They're, they're locked in social media or video games or whatever, and the alienation and anatomy is very profound. How do you convince them to go for a walk or a hike or go swimming or dunking or whatever? Because that seems to me to be the profound challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, I, we were just lamenting, my wife and I were lamenting, mm -hmm. they, we heard about, I guess, somebody whose nine-year-old is so addicted to video games that they've you know, changed the Wi-Fi passwords, they've locked up the controllers, like it's deep. Yeah. So what you're describing sounds extreme, but it's it's not actually that extreme. No, no, not at all. So to me, it's like, just go outside, you know, lock the doors. But in this case, the kid actually broke down the door to get back inside to play. So yeah. it's, it's deep. And I mean, I think setting norms early on, so um, getting them when they're young to go outside and spend as much time as possible. But no, these challenges are, are monstrous. Yeah, I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm with you. They are monstrous. I had someone ask me the exact same question at a counseling conference, mm. and I was like, I don't know what to say. That's <laughs> yeah. a tough question. And her and I chatted about it, and um, the person that she was talking about was quite young, mm. and we were like, maybe animals are awake. If there's something about watching um nature documentaries that is just fascinating yeah especially when they're pitched in a way that you feel like there's some sort of mm -hmm. emotional connection um and it also reminds me of this more anecdotal but um when i was working in youth mental health i was working with a young person who was not able to go outside um for months at a time mm -hmm. and i would bring bits of nature in to her and we draw them so she wasn't necessarily interested in the leaf for the leaf's sake mm -hmm. but thinking about the intricacy of those lines mm -hmm. was fascinating to her mm -hmm. what did that do i don't know mm -hmm. but there was some intention on my part that it might do something yeah i'm curious what you think about your own question <laughs> that's <laughs> not fair <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Counselors. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I wonder, I mean, would an analogy of your research be that it's like taking people who are somewhat interested in meditation, but getting them very interested in meditation mm -hmm. by way of curing some sense of alienation or suffering in them? But what about people who actually could use meditation or forest bathing or whatever as a modality for wellness and getting introducing them to that? That seems to me to be the the bigger challenge, mm -hmm. people who are all, who are already fundamentally cut off, mm -hmm. um, and I think something jarring, you know, major documentaries is one thing, but then they're on a couch and they're just using using Netflix film. They can very easily just go to a video game because it's on the same couch. Mm -hmm. um, but something that jars them, you know, um, in the opposite way that the pandemic jarred people, but jarred them into the basements mm -hmm. of, our, of our lives, but jarring them outside. Mm -hmm like a snow day yeah yeah like a snow day or the or the um the wi-fi is just off like mm -hmm. not like fundamentally off like it's out of the house mm -hmm. and they have no other option mm -hmm. um, so. mm -hmm. i'm reminded of a practice of no tech for one hour a day yeah one day a week and i think it's one week of the year mm -hmm. yeah like a sabbath kind of thing yeah. you know mm -hmm. to open their consciousness to other options Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the therapeutic value of what you're finding in your in your interviews becomes more that they're more able to experience it. Mm -hmm. it seems to me. I don't know. Yeah, what, do you, what do you think? You're the you're the expert. Uh, <laughs> I'm just a parent. Um, yeah, 
jarring. I mean, yes, if you can do it, yeah. would be my thought. Is that like, I don't have a lot of experience um, with counseling with with young, quite young people, but engagement is tricky. Yeah. And buy-in is tricky. So you're right, watching a documentary, you're still on the couch, but it's like, what's kind of that, the little step that's going to get, maybe open the doorway. Yeah. And maybe it is throwing out their cell phone and watch her. I think there's an aspect of parents having to team up also on their yeah. the kids. Like mm. if their friends aren't doing it, it's not likely they're going to do it. But if, if their parents are also concerned, you say, we're going to do this thing. Why don't you do it with us? And they can even make it a competition or a challenge or make it friendly. Or we're all going for a hike this day. You know, but it's, it's hard to do things alone. Mm -hmm. There was one, um, and we, might, we talked about this when we went for coffee, and I wonder about the risks of over-identifying with some of the ecosystem components where somebody who's so attached to their forest, I'm thinking of somebody I knew who was so attached to their forest, and when that forest was developed into housing, he lost his mountain bike playground, uh, and this was just devastating. He was in his late teens at the time. Are there, are there risks to over-identifying with parts of ecosystems or nature as a whole that, um, and what do we do about that if that is a risk? Maybe it's not. Hmm. <clears throat> identify. Yeah, I guess there's risk to anything that are taken to an extreme where they become debilitating or they were no longer effective or functional than what we cease to be effective. Um, so, yeah, I would say if over-identification is um, going to take you out of the game, then that sounds like too much. And at the same time, I do think there is a call for us to feel very deeply and that it's with social media and lots of distractions, it's easy to numb and it's easy to desensitize and it's easy to distract. And I think that there, there is a call to feel that pain and to, to step into the grief and know that the anxiety can actually be a sign of health, that we're paying attention, that we are connected, that we are concerned about our own well-being and the well-being of everyone we're connected to. So, so yeah, Greg's question is really good. I mean, okay. because there's, there's one thing about, you know, developing a forest that, that you used to love, mm -hmm. but what if the entire forest just burns down? which of course is not unimaginable for those of us who live mm -hmm. in the forest um, and it seems to be happening more and more so a, a person that you're that you're counseling who is deeply identified with a forest that burns down or an ocean that becomes toxic to swim in um, then is really at a loss and then and then do you sort of say well okay but you don't have the forest or the ocean anymore but you have the rivers and they say, no, no, actually, the rivers are gone too. Because after the forest burnt down, then the rivers got all toxic too. So I hate to be so doom and gloom, <laughs> but I'm just thinking bad. about I'm, I'm thinking about some some young people I know who can very easily every everything I suggest to them like this, they can just counter it. Yeah, but you know what's happened to the forest and what's happened to microplastics in the ocean, and, mm -hmm. and um, it's dark. Mm -hmm. And so then. Um, and it's a bit easier in Cascadia where things are so abundant and rich and you know regenerate fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. But in other spaces, I wonder what the situation would be. Mm -hmm. That's a hard question. And you're right, it is dark. Yeah. Um, and it is also true that it's not all dark. And I think that's maybe where we pay a bit more attention to what we're taking in and what we're consuming and how balanced that is. Because if we want to doom scroll all day, that information is at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think part of it is having that self-awareness to check in and say, like, is this resourcing me? Is this helpful? Is this is this amount of information actually something I can use? Or yeah. is this just doing what it's intended to do, which is capture my attention? Um, because yes. The oceans and the forests and the rivers might all be doomed, but that's not the whole story. I get sucked into that all the time, yeah. feeling like it is all doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. And I need people like Patricia to remind me that it's not. Yeah. Um, and that's hard work that takes self awareness. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to do what I thought we were going to do 20 minutes ago, but we're going to do it now. So <laughs> you stay here. And uh, we will now turn to Zoom and or people in the room. Thank
thanks very much, Meg. That was that's great. Well, thanks very much, Meg. So do you want to ask the is sure. there one on Zoom? Yeah. Um, so Jessica, the cook is saying, um, what has become of your original desperation? What she means by that <laughs> is that at the beginning you talked about coming to the research from a place of desperation desperation as a counselor and as an individual concerned about the climate crisis. Has that changed over the course of doing this research? What tools or resources have you found? Is eco-spirituality a strategy that you now feel you can deploy professionally? Wow, thanks Jessica, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> Many questions. What has become of my desperation? Um, it's still there, but I feel like I'm bigger than it. It doesn't feel as all-encompassing as it once did. And I think I have my participants to thank in large part for that. It's like really inspiring to meet young people in like their teens and 20s who are thinking really deeply and finding um, just like tons of resources and support that they need and um, <coughs> are wise. It's like really amazing to meet young, wise people. Um, so I often like have their words playing in my head and those have become a bit of a toolkit of like, what would so-and-so say about this? And I'm like, oh yeah, she has found her way through um, and been in the thick of it. So it doesn't feel like ignorance or naivete, it feels like hard won. Um, there is, I hope, sometimes. <laughs> um, and in terms of employing or deploying eco-spirituality in a professional context, work in progress, what that will look like. Um, I can't say that it like naturally comes up much in counseling sessions, um, but sometimes it does. Or sometimes people are speaking in very eco-spiritual terms without using that term. And it's kind of like a platform for like diving deeper in that direction. Um, I won't give any specific examples, but uh, yeah, it's there. It's there for sure. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. The first one, is, I'm just a little bit curious about your data set, like in terms of who did you talk, like uh, beyond um, kind of the demographic, some, I guess, factors in, in terms of recruitment. And the second one, I apologize in advance for this, but this is coming seriously from a place of curiosity, mm -hmm. but also probably a peril of my own discipline. But um, what are your interlocutors or participants utilizing the terminology eco-spirituality or spirituality? Is this a term that you're bringing and using to define them? And if they, if it's one, if it's them, like what are they understanding as kind of spirituality and like, and are they braiding things amongst other kind of traditions or experiences that they're locating in? Like what is kind of the constellation of spirituality that they're giving you? Does that make sense? I think that makes sense, yeah. yes. Because so, I sense from some of this that mm -hmm. it's not singular, that perhaps there is things that are being crafted by them, but that may be mm -hmm. a wrong read on my part. I don't think so. Um, so to answer that question first, I let people define spirituality for themselves however they wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, and not everyone used that language, but most people did, would offer that up as like, yes, of course, there's a spiritual dimension to my, my relationship with the natural world. Um, Eco-spirituality specifically, no. No one used that no term. One used it. Yeah, that would be, um, yeah, just pulling from the literature that that phrase seemed to um, kind of capture this very nature-based spirituality. Right. Yeah, can't remember if that was your whole question or not. Mm -hmm. Not really. <laughs> I think there's like so much in what you just said in terms of if your participants were kind of saying spirituality, I just like wonder what that meant and how they were crafting it. But we don't have to get into that now. But we could talk about the data set, I guess, if you want. Like the yeah. data set in terms of like who did you talk to the people, more about information about the people that you spoke to. More about the okay, sure. So the people that I spoke to are between 18 and 28. Um mostly women, um, some queer individuals. 
um, some people who identified as indigenous. Uh, is it, am I kind of in the right direction? Yeah, like and geographically, concept? in terms of racial identities, in terms of so like class, of those are information or things you were looking for, mm -hmm. or maybe you weren't. I'm just, so I'm just curious about like, yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Most of that information was volunteered by the participants, so they kind of talked about what they felt was relevant mm -hmm. to the topic. Um, most were students. Um, they're all living in BC, but one came from Newfoundland, some from Ontario, someone was from um, Oregon um, and Alberta. People had kind of lived all over the country, but were living in BC at the time. Um, in terms of class, I, I couldn't tell you. I didn't ask that question specifically. Um, what else? What have I missed? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a, a, a very good question. Just to come back to, I think, your, your first one. Like Sometimes if you're inviting a person to talk to you about a uh, project you're doing on spirituality, that automatically gears the conversation to that, right? So in other words, you've introduced the category. And it's hard to get at the issues you're looking at without introducing the category, which then makes it a uh, kind of a, it is a faith accompli, it's, it's in the conversation already. And mm -hmm. I, I gather that's what it was, right? Like you, the word spirituality was probably in the invitation. The word spirituality was in the invitation. Um, I think it was an or, like emotional and or spiritual, mm. because some of the people, some of the people who came said, no, like, right. it's not a spiritual thing for me, but it is an emotional thing. Um, I guess that's yeah. a good point. Yeah. Okay. No, that's that's not a, it's not a critique. It's just mm -hmm. a, the nature of the research, right? That's totally yeah, that's fine. helping me think about yep. it differently. Though, yep. thank you. Um, yeah, Megan Hollander has a question, and it's similar to a question I wanted to ask, which I think comes out of this too. Um, is your research sample is all living in BC? So, how much does BC play into this, right? Mm -hmm. Because we all know from living here and from the Cascadia Research Project that there is something particular about here, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm working on Megan's question here, but basically, do you think you, your findings might be different if you did this in Winnipeg? Um, <laughs> or, Toronto. or Toronto, yeah, or, yeah. Or this is almost not even imaginable in Winnipeg. <laughs> yeah, right? But that's, the, I guess that's the question yeah. then, right? Like how much right. is, your, is your data really bound by it being here? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say it is, and also maybe it isn't completely. Um, and the part that it isn't is from having people who have moved here relatively recently. And so thinking of the, the person from Newfoundland specifically, it's like my home is Newfoundland. That's where I feel connected to the land. That's where my traditions are. That's where my people are. I'm here. It's great. But really, um, her deep sense of connection is there. Um, but for many others, it was growing up in Alberta, not feeling like they were understood there, not feeling like they had the, the nature of connection that they were looking for, and then coming here and it being a, a really different experience. And like, um, yeah, we do know there's something incredible about the West Coast. Um, and people talked about that specifically, saying that the, the size of the trees like were unimaginable to them growing up in Ontario. And it really brought this sense of awe for being by the ocean. It's like, people live here, like this is paradise. So did it skew the sample? Yes, I think it did. I think um, this was like a hub of people who feel a deep connection to nature. Um, yeah. So that, that's there. That's I mean, definitely present. Megan Hollinger is, I think, writing for Montreal or Ottawa right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And Rachel's example of Winnipeg. So <laughs> those are three good examples where the surrounding countryside in the winter wants to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not making that up. <laughs> it's legit what right. happens. Whereas yeah. here, I think the people you're, you're interviewing <clears throat> don't have a sense that they walk out the door and their lives are in peril. Mm -hmm. But that's that's January 13th, <laughs> February 12th. That's just ordinary days in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. So I wonder to what extent that way to narrate or the way to imagine the outside world, that's what makes this place different and what makes it therapeutically yokeable. Is that, mm -hmm. is that a word? Usable? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I've lived in Ottawa and the winters are, yes, brutal and also beautiful. Wow. Yeah. Um, and people cross country ski and they skid on the canal and they're still finding ways if they want to, yeah. to connect. Um, and I can imagine that it's, it's a factor. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. How exactly? Maybe my next study, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, something to think about for sure yeah um yeah in the front row oh, um, did your data reveal any um a relationship between um having a relationship with nature and a greater agency to want to act mm -hmm. greater agency i'm not sure if i saw greater agency but i think i saw um like a stronger impulse or like um i don't want to say sense of duty because it wasn't duty it was coming from this place of love and care not obligation but it seemed to um be more unshakable like there was a firmer ground for that action um and to sustain that action over time i think i think i could say yeah. Thank you. Were you gonna ask? I, I was. Yeah, you go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So this is really fascinating. Are you looking as you're uh, uh, learning about eco spirituality to find ways maybe to help other people accept it or integrate it, or to find ways to influence other people to have that realization of eco spirituality? Am I thinking of ways that I could do I that? I mean, did, will this study help mm -hmm. other people become more eco spiritual? I don't know, will it, Andy? <laughs> <laughs> is it working on you? A little bit. But is there evangelical? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think yes, but not necessarily that I have a mission to do that. But more that I am seeing like so many access points for that so that you could start a community garden without a secret mission of developing eco spirituality, but could trust that hands in the dirt, sustained time in nature, that that could just naturally come kind of from the ground up um, <clears throat> without any agenda. And I think that rock climbing could do that. Um, camping trips can do that. Uh, artwork can do that. This image in the bottom right hand corner is a young person who is just fascinated with identifying mushrooms. And she uses her little hand lens to um, be able to look at the mushroom from all angles without touching it so she doesn't have to disturb it. And she was saying how just like, slowing down and walking through spaces so slowly um, so as to observe everything and identify her mushrooms has just changed her worldview. Mm -hmm. um, but no one told her to like go foster her eco spirituality. That's just happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Except and it would be kind of a buzzkill if somebody did. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. That. Especially if spirituality feels a bit funny yeah um and we don't ever need to call it that mm -hmm. and that's maybe coming back to what Shivana was saying is like maybe that term in and of itself is like could be a barrier to some people mm -hmm. um but then choose something else that fits for you and just yeah keep at it hi Meg hi Lily. And thank you so much for doing such a beautiful um holistic approach to your research to include art and conversation and nature responsive practices to open all those doors at once is really something so i mean i want to talk about how systems thinking you know affected mm -hmm. what was happening in the work that reconnects and all the things that i know you know because i know you um and i know your skill set which is just madly wild uh, but i really want to know uh, if the participants, if you think the participants had some sort of um, some sort of a um, 
an additional experience in being witnessed in their nature experiences. So it's one thing to go out rock climbing as a solo act or to go and look for mushrooms. But when you're actually telling somebody about that and putting words around that and shaping that, presenting it at an interview, and you're being witnessed and you're being paraphrased by someone who has counseling training who will say, did I hear you say, and you're having it mirrored back to you. I mean, that in itself is a form of medicine. And I just wondered if you noticed anything happening in those moments of your interviews themselves, mm -hmm. anything that struck you, yeah. you know, that's the noticing, the noticing. Right. 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 Well, that's a great <laughs> yeah. question. You can tell that Hillary's a counselor too. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. A lot of, this, so this wasn't my noticing, but yeah. their noticing would be at the end of the conversation saying, I've never talked about this before. Yes. Um, I never thought about this before. Mm -hmm. I There's wish community. I had talked about this mm -hmm. um, or I had more spaces to talk about. Um, and then, yeah, people were making sense of their experience in real time because they had never talked about it before and maybe had never been asked those questions. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was fun to yeah. be a part of that. Yeah. I was learning, they were learning. It's witness culture too. Mm -hmm. We're actually witnessing each other. Something mm -hmm. happens in those moments to you too, which is Absolutely. fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're changed by all of this. Mm -hmm. Yum. Very happy. Pick up on Hillary's really sure. wonderful question and just say, how did it change your sense of your job as a as a therapist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been thinking about that recently, and writing away my dissertation and mm -hmm. thinking, I came into this being like, how do I help a client in the therapy room? Mm -hmm. Like, what can I say? And <laughs> Now, almost at the end, I feel like this is this kind of conversation best happens in a group. Oh. Um, wow. I mean, I'm sure there are exceptions to that now yeah. that I say that, but um, I've been part of <laughs> climate cafes where no one's trying to solve anyone else's emotional experience. Um, and it's incredibly therapeutic to be, like Hillary said, witnessed. And, and councils, you've been mm -hmm. parts of councils. And parts of councils mm -hmm. where you, you know you're not alone. And it's not just you and the therapist, it's you and 10 other people who are all saying, yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so that's, okay. that's a piece of it for sure. Is there another question in the room? Yeah. Yep. Oh. Thanks very much, Meg. I was just wondering how much uh, eco-spirituality is connected to maybe eroding a lot of the anthropocentric sort of tendencies from <laughs> capitalism, neoliberalism that a lot of like individuals experience. Like I had the child who kept wanting to play video games because of maybe like an appetitive kind of desire that a lot of culture and society is, is dictating to us. So I'm just wondering like how much is eco-spirituality kind of an erosion of that or how can eco-spirituality channel some of those neoliberal tendencies or repetitive mm -hmm. desires and tendencies. Mm -hmm. Like there's probably some really great books written on that. <laughs> I could probably give you five. Um, I think it is helping to erode that or bring us back to something we used to know. Um, I think eco-spirituality helps us to see ourselves as like one of many in a web as opposed to something hierarchical. Um, so it's egalitarian in that sense, certainly, um, and really shifts a sense of like values and priorities, um, coming back to that sort of neoliberal capitalist framework. It's like, what are we here to do and who matters? And, um, yeah, how does that shape the priorities, our priorities in the way we live our lives? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I think we could stay here a lot longer and those people who are fellows at the center will join us tomorrow at 11 o'clock to tease out uh, the talk today. And those of you who have yet to be fellows at the center, this is a passive aggressive way <laughs> to encourage you all of the fellows at the center. So you'd be welcome to join us for coffee. But anyway, thank you very much for, for being here with us. And to, um, next week, um, same time, but different place in, in 
uh, is the John Albert Hall Lecture Series. Queerness isn't inclusive and the church shouldn't be either. So join us for that um, at five o'clock in, um, what's the name of it? David Lamb. David Lamb Building, which is in room 4 and Building 8, 144. You'll see lots of signs around. So there is a um, registration we're asking people to do, kind of to give us a sense of catering needs, because there will be some like catering there. Anyway, please, uh, as we wrap up, please join me at 19 and 19. Yay.